Folks in accounting, finance, and accounts payable are laser focused on recording, classifying, reporting, reconciling, and analyzing transactions. How they accomplished that back in the dark ages is very different from how it is done today. What's more, we're standing on the precipice of a cataclysmic transformation in the evolution of the function. Join us for a quick look at the innovations that have made an impact on the accounting and finance world over the last 500 plus years, as well as a look at where we're going in the next few years. Make sure you stick around until the end when we share some strategy every forward-looking professionals can use to ensure they not only survive this upheaval, but they thrive. Let's take a look back at what I call yesterday, in the very beginning. Luca Bartolomeo de Pacchioli, and I apologize for my pronunciation, an Italian mathematician, is widely regarded as the father of accounting. In 1494, he published a book entitled Summa de Aritmetica Geometrica Proportionae et Proportionaliata. Again, my apologies. A 600 page book which translates to summary of arithmetic, geometry, proportions, and proportionality. It included 27 pages devoted to accounting, including double entry accounting. Why was this information first published in a mathematics book? Pacioli considered accounting to be the mathematics of business. There are some very vague references to Maria Clara. Imart, a well-respected German astronomer who lived from 1676 to 1707 as being the mother of accounting, but I can find no documentation to back up what her contributions were. And trust me when I tell you, I spent a lot of time researching this dead end. So this is unconfirmed at this point. For a long time, records were kept by hand, ledgers in big books were common, and financial statements rudimentary if produced at all. Fast forward 200 years, and we saw the passage of the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, which were the foundations for GAAP. Next innovation to impact the accounting and accounts payable space. Fast forward the introduction of the mainframe. The second half of the 20th century saw the introduction of computers to the business community. At this point, we are talking about mainframe computers, those huge monolithic machines with data being entered via the use of punch cards. In fact, there used to be a job called punch, key punch operator. A key punch is a device for precisely punching holes into stiff paper cards at specific locations as determined by the keys struck by the human operator was called a key punch operator. And this is how information got into computers. People actually carried around big boxes of key punch cards. And heaven forbids you dropped a box. Clearly, big mainframe computers were something only larger organizations were able to avoid. Many small and mid-sized companies continued to rely on big ledges recording everything by hand. I can only imagine how many duplicate payments were made and went undetected. Interesting side note, at this point, many computer programmers were women. Moving right around, moving right on with what I call a more manageable and affordable computer. Now, some listening to this may think that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak created the first desktop computer, but that is not exactly what happened. Although to be fair, they get a lot of credit for expanding its use along with Bill Gates and Microsoft. The first desktop computer was the Olivetti Programma 101, which was unveiled at the 1964 New York World's Fair and released to the public in 1965. The next innovation incur occurred in the very late 70s and early 80s. It was the personal computer which radically changed the way businesses operated. It was an innovation made, if you will, in heaven for the accounting and finance community. Initially, desktop computers were big and clunky and without applications for the real business world. They were the purview of hobbyists 
and I'm guessing most of those hobbyists were male. The Apple I was introduced on April 1st, 1976. One of its big innovations was that it came assembled, not a box of parts that you had to put together. The cost was $666.66. There's no magic in that price, either good or bad behind the number, simply Wozniak's love of repeating numbers. If you had one of them today, along with the original documentation, it would be worth $300,000. Microsoft was formed, was founded just a year earlier. Its claim to fame, or its goal, it got its name on the map, if you will, was a deal in 1980, which permitted the sale of an operating system to IBM, who was now producing new desktop computers to compete with Apple. At this point, most professionals who worked in accounts payable were women and most had high school diplomas. Few college graduates worked in accounts payable, although a few did. The same could be said for many other transactional accounting and finance positions. Now we have the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet contribution. To take the, these new desktop computers into the business world, there needed to be an equally easy to use application. Spreadsheets were the answer. In 1979, VisiCalc was created for the Apple II with this rudimentary spreadsheet program was a real game changer. Side note, I was looking for a way to expand my skill set a few years later after the introduction of VisiCalc and our department had acquired an Apple. I think it was a 3E, but don't hold me to that. I asked if I could learn how to use it. I got handed the instructions and a tutorial that was on a floppy disk, one of those big ones. It was an absolute game changer both for me and our department. Very quickly I was able to create a very simple program to calculate our daily cash flow. No more double checking the math even when there was a last minute cash receipt or expense which seemed to happen every day. And of course we no longer had to worry about the admin being able to read my handwriting on the little report I produced. This simple program probably saved us an hour a day. There were reports of programs being written that saved 20 or more hours a week. That's half a job if you consider a 40-hour work week. I want to make such a big deal about this because I believe we are facing a similar situation with AI. I'll talk more about addressing that challenge a little later on, but I want to allay some of the fears about AI eliminating jobs. What, that's what they said about the desktops. Yes, they did eliminate some jobs, but more new jobs were created. VisiCalc was followed very quickly by Lotus 1, 2, 3, and then Excel, and now Google Sheets. Back to our evolution and a look at where we are today. I call the next section, the next stuff we're going to talk about, a computer on every desk. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to see the potential of these new machines for the finance and accounting profession, nor did you need to be a brain surgeon to learn how to use them. Now this is not to say that computers, like most technology, do not engender their own moments of frustration, that they were relatively user-friendly, a term that was fast becoming commonplace. By the end of the 1980s, most, but definitely not all, all professionals had a desktop computer on their desk at work and a few of them even had one at home. Even though accounts payable might seem like the place they should have gone to first, that's not how it played out in the real world. In many organizations, accounts payable got computers when they got the hand-me-down computers from other departments when those other departments were upgrading to newer, higher-powered computers, and they were thrilled to get them. As time went on, that changed, and eventually everybody had a computer, and the hand-me-down game stopped. Also, LANs, local area networks, were starting to become popular. At this point, a few organizations were starting to hire college graduates, some with degrees in accounting, some with other degrees, to work in and manage their accounts payable function. This meant that in some cases, but definitely not all, salaries were starting to rise modestly. The beginning of the cloud. The internet began as a medium for government researchers to share information, and it started in the 1960s. That's right, it started before desktops were even, desktops were even the gleam in anyone's eye other than maybe science fiction writing. At that time, it was all text, no graphic. Not very interesting to the average Joe or the average Jane. The World Wide Web, as we know it today, grew out of an innovation in the late 1980s by a European lab in Switzerland for particle physics. The web was not available until the, to the public until April 30th, 1993. It was not easy 
to use or understand, but that changed quickly. By 1995, it is reported that over 24 million people in the US and Canada were spending over five hours a week on the internet. To put all this in perspective, remember, Google was founded in 1998, Amazon in 1995, and Facebook, which started as an exclusive membership organization for Harvard students in 2004, was not open to the public until 2006. All you needed to join was an email address. And speaking of email, technically the first email was sent in 1971, but it was several decades before email became commonplace. I got my first email account at work in 1994. It had a big, unwieldy, I had a big, unwieldy email address. The problem was that you could only use it to communicate with other people who also had an email address, and there were only few. We'd actually sit around and sit, think about who has an email account, but that changed quickly. AOL, Hotmail, and Yahoo offered free accounts to anyone who wanted one, and people signed up in droves, even though many didn't have computers at home. They simply accessed their personal email from their work computer. Side fact of interest, at least to me. Cyber Monday became the big online shopping day and was created to encourage online shopping. I believe they picked this day rather than a weekend day because they realized that many people did not have computers at home and they would shop once they got to work. But enough about that. Back to our story on the evolution of accounting and accounts payable and the impacts of current changes on you and your professional future. Cloud computing. This innovation permitted the delivery of computer services anywhere, anytime. It facilitated remote work, which was a huge help to many but definitely not everybody, when COVID hit. Once again, Amazon led the way, introducing its cloud computing services in 2006, followed two years later by a similar service from Google. Companies such as Dropbox, which launched in 2007, make use of Amazon cloud computing. Automation. We can't continue this conversation without discussing automation in the whole accounting space. At the very end of the 20th, 20th century, a few large companies started in automating their invoice processing. These systems were clunky, expensive, and required expensive upgrades any time there was an ERP update. This cost, the, their cost was in the millions of dollars. The implementation time often stretched as long as a year. At, some at the same time, third-party service providers started developing automation solutions for the whole accounting process, with, with much of the initial projects being post focused on the invoice processing function, also cash application. Because of the nature of the work of processing invoices, accounts payable has been the focus of many of these first automation solutions. Although I may Mention accounts payable. I don't want to give you the idea that they were the only function being transformed by automation. Uh, cash application, expense report, monitoring, and policy compliance are two other big areas, and they are just the tip of the iceberg. Initially, these systems were quite expensive, but not as expensive as creating your own from scratch. Also, initially, many decided they wanted to customize these third-party offerings, which they quickly learned was a big mistake. Why? Because anytime there was an ERP upgrade, they had to rejigger their customization to work with the upgrade. That has more or less stopped. Today, automation solutions for invoice handling, accounts payable, and a myriad of other accounting functions are commonplace, easier to use, i.e. user-friendly, and inexpensive. There is a model for just about every pocketbook, and these solutions are now widely used. But this is not the end of the story, not by a long shot. By, by the way, in case you were wondering, as of mid-2024, Accounts Payable still has more women in it than men. Most estimate that between 70 and 80 percent of those people working in Accounts Payable are women, and today a good number of them have college degrees and some MBAs. At this point, we are talking only a little bit about today in Accounting and Accounts Payable, and I'm starting to look in the future at what I call tomorrow, a very different environment, which will be a very different environment, thanks in large part to technology. I think this issue is so important that in mid-June, we are running a whole week of broadcast called AP Technology Week. In addition to the broadcast, we're giving away cheat sheets each day to help you run a more efficient and effective operation and running several raffles where the prizes are resources to help you professionally. There are some books as well as a six-month platinum AP Now membership. See the description for details on how to register. Okay, on 
want back to our story enter ai artificial intelligence this could be even a bigger game change for all parts of the accounting function than excel and the introduction of personal computers was but it does not have to be scary on november 30th 2022 chat gpt was launched as many of you know this is a free ai tool available to anyone who signs up to use it by by no stretch of the imagination is this the first time we are seeing ai in everyday use anyone who has interacted no matter how frustrating that interaction may have been has encountered ai it is commonly used rather effectively i might add by everyday applications like google maps alexa siri spam filters and many customer service applications now there are several very important things for all listening and watching this to realize. Number one, it will get better. It has been improving and will continue to do so. But number two, it makes mistakes and some of those mistakes are horrendous. So you cannot rely on it without checking. At this point, you should not be using it for your 1099 filings or anything that requires precise, accurate information that is frequently updated. Make sure you verify anything that comes out of it. Use it as an aid or a tool, but that is it. Number three, and this is really important, corporate leaders indicate they want to hire people who know how to use AI, with 71% saying they'd rather hire a less experienced job candidate with AI skills than a more experienced candidate without them. This is according to Microsoft's new 2024 Work Trend Index report. Four, you need to learn how to use AI quickly as it will give you a big leg up on the competition. Two of the more popular applications are ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot. This AP Now YouTube channel has videos on each and will include links to those in the description. What has become clear from the speed that AI has entered the marketplace and management's desire to hire people who know how to use it is that the job market has changed. But what are these new AI skills and how can you get them? I believe each person has the ability and the means to acquire these new skills without spending a red cent. I'm not talking about becoming an AI programmer, but rather how to use these new application and acquire these desired AI skills. We identified three such skills recently and created a short video explaining about them in a little bit of detail and how to acquire them yourself. You should watch it right now using the link that has appeared in your YouTube screen and is in the description. It will help you land that dream job. Good luck.